Hey everyone, guess what? This is the second videotaping of this video because apparently I pressed the mute button on the first one. Thankfully, I've got it down pretty good. <laughs> Anyways, today we're going to talk about the physical layer of the OSI model. And uh, again, these videos are designed to be short and sweet. I don't want them to be overwhelming and uh, so on. So we're going to cover just the stuff that you need to know. Probably going to go over a little bit of history because some of this stuff actually is uh, fairly old in itself. Um, but the good thing about the OSI models is there's seven layers, like I discussed in the high-level OSI model video. Seven layers, it doesn't matter who manufactures what or what technology, um, it's all the seven layers still apply. And for the reasons I mentioned on the, um, the high-level OSI video, like uh, eases troubleshooting and allows manufacturers to focus on only one layer at a time, things like that. So this is a perfect example of allowing manufacturers to only focus on one layer at a time. So let's get right into the, the uh, physical layer of the OSI model. First thing here is that uh, data at the physical layer is called a bit, meaning it's either a one or a zero. It's not an A, an E, or F, or a 7, or a 2, or anything else. It's either 1 or a 0. And how those bits are ordered actually means something. So for example, we have uh, a bunch of 1s and zeros there. If you feel like you want to figure out what that means, feel free to do the, uh, do the research. Um, if you do find out what it means, please, sure, please let me know, because uh, it would be interesting to see who uh, knows how to do this. So when dealing with the physical layer, I view this layer as, I don't want to say the dumbest layer, but the, any hardware dealing at, uh, with the physical layer is going to be what I call unintelligent. So for example, like 10 base T connectors or Cat5 connectors, uh, wire, fiber optic cable, things like that. All of that would be unintelligent hardware. So we're not talking about routers that make routing and switching decisions and we're not talking about layer two switches uh, w which makes switching decisions or bridges which make bridges bridging decisions things like that we're talking about unintelligent hardware and we'll expand on what that means I'll give you some clear examples um, as well as hopefully uh, put you in a position where you're not going to be confused uh, if you're planning on taking a certification test of some sort all right so uh, getting right into it um, responsibilities of the physical layer are electrical properties. So like what is the voltage going over the wire? Uh, transmission media, is it wire or is it wireless? Transmission devices so like modems, whatever. Uh, physical topology, how is it, uh, how, is the, how are the wires laid out? Are they in a star network, a bus network, things like that. We'll talk about that. Data signaling, synchronization, and then bandwidth. Bandwidth is pretty easy. How fast is it going? All right, in transmission media, um, what we have are known as either bound or unbound pathways of the media. Um, so bound uh, media is, is media that you can touch, like wire or fiber optic cable or things like that. Uh, obviously, from a security standpoint, if you have bound media, fiber optic cable is the most secure because it's kind of hard to intercept light. It is not hard to intercept uh, electrical signals as they go over a uh, you know cat 6 cable or something like that so bound media is media you can touch then obviously unbound media is is a method of transmission that you can't touch like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth microwave or laser infrared things like that now it's also important to understand that just because you can't touch it doesn't mean it can't touch you uh, so if you're dealing with microwave or some infrared, some high-powered lasers for transmitting data, make sure you are obviously thinking of safety um, because uh, standing in front of a microwave dish while it's on is, is not a comfortable feeling. So it's super important to understand that. Also, uh, sometimes bound media is called tangible media because you can touch it uh, or intangible for unbound media doesn't really matter what you call it so long as you understand that if it's if you can touch it it's tangible and bound if it's but if you want to call it bound media or tangible media, it doesn't really matter so we also have transmission devices so a real popular transmission device that's found at the physical layer would be a modem um, there's also another real popular one that I'll probably spend a little bit of time discussing 
but if you happen to have modems then maybe you're living in you know 1980 still who knows um, I don't think there's too many modems that are still out there but you know you, you never know uh, we can also have multiplexers CSU DSUs uh, CSU DSU would be for like a, a T1 line uh, while if you have a T1 in your environment you you, you could have an internal CSU DSU inside of your, your router, or you might have an external CSU DSU. You can also have repeaters. Uh, repeaters are uh, basically a device that takes a signal and amplifies it. Good data and the noise that's on that, on that line as well. Um, that is, so a repeater just amplifies everything, the good and the bad at the same time. And I don't think I said what multi, so multiplexers takes a uh, multiple signals, puts it together into one signal, sends it, and then at the opposite end, a mul the, uh, uh, it'll break it out. But the big one are active and passive hubs. So an active hub is something that requires an external power source. A passive hub is something that doesn't, you know, might pull power from the, the network cable itself. What a hub is, is and from the technical standpoint, a hub is a device, a multi-port device. Probably don't have these anymore, but you might run across one or two every once in a while. Probably in your shadow IT environment when a person wanted more than one network cable uh, for maybe his laptop and his work computer or, or whatever, but he doesn't want to pay for another line or he doesn't want to tell the IT team that they need to run another line he know it get denied so he stick in he sticks in a hub or maybe a switch to do the same thing a hub the data coming in on one port is sent out all other ports so uh, and that's not what a switch does so a hub again data coming coming in on so let's say it's an eight port hub if data came in on port number one that same amount of data would go th go out port seven through eight or I'm sorry, a two through eight math. Um, so it's important to understand how hubs work and how they're different from switches. Now we do discuss switches in the data link layer uh, video because that's where switches reside. You can also have layer three switches in the, and we'll discuss some of those in the network video. Um, but for now, just, just view hubs as only in the, um, the physical layer because that's where they're at. So how do you determine if something is in the physical layer or not? A real easy way to remember is if it has a MAC address, then it is at least at the data link layer. If it's a piece of equipment that is designed to communicate in some form or fashion and it does not have a MAC address, then it's at the physical layer. Another way of looking at it, if let's say you have a small network and uh, like five computers, 10, whatever, and you're running Wireshark on uh, one of the computers. If while running Wireshark, you can pick up a MAC address from the, from the device that's connecting all of those computers together, then it's a switch. If you can run Wireshark and see all of the devices, but not what they're all plugged into, then it's a hub. It's important to understand that. All right, then we have physical topology. This is basically how uh, the network is set up. Um, we have old school stuff, 10 base 2, 10 base 5. If you're in an environment uh, where you're having to deal with 10 base 2 or 10 base 5, uh, I, you might want to consider going somewhere else for a job because that's called thick net. It's about as, the cable is about as big around as a thumb. Really hard to manipulate. It's, to, it's a pain to deploy. You don't really want to have to deal with that, but it is technology that could be viewed as testable. Uh, so, and again, it's called thick net and uh, vampire taps are used. You, you don't, you don't want to deal with that. We also have a star network, which is an upgrade to uh, the bus network. Uh, but, you know, 10 base T, 100 base T, gigabit, uh, anything ethernet based would be viewed as a, um, as a star network from the physical topology standpoint. And if you want to see what that looks like, uh, literally you could just take your network and draw it out draw all the cables and you'll see all these little stars start to f start to uh, show up with uh, you know computers on on the outskirts of of the star itself and then you know connecting to a central switch and then uh, and that switch probably connects to another switch or maybe a router or something 
You can also have token ring. Uh, token ring is um, old school technology, but still kind of in use because it uh, fiber optic uses token ring. Um, so in in some fiber cases, you'll have um, uh, basically if you take everything and kind of draw it out, it becomes a ring. Um, other in other cases uh, with with tokens and or token based networks uh, we'll get into it but you know it's asynchronous or synchronous communication uh, we'll talk about that in a minute though you can also have mesh um, most likely you won't see mesh too much but you will see it in a core environment where you have like your core switches or maybe your core routers and each device has a connection to all the other core devices for the purposes of redundancy and uh, and so on uh, in case one device goes down it's not a big deal because you have a mesh network then obviously you can have wireless <coughs> wireless is kind of a an unbound method of connecting to an access point which kind of creates a, a sort of star network um, in relation to how it could be configured um, so just be aware that wireless you know is is something in there wireless topology that is so you can also have different connection types based on geographical locations so for example let's say you had an office in Houston and then an office in London you might be using the primary route uh, you know an undersea internet cable uh, that might be one way of getting you know to London or back and forth from London Houston but what if uh, what if somebody cut that internet cable uh, or, or whatever, then you'd probably, you know, maybe have a satellite backup. So you're going from one type of topology to another type of topology and one type of media to another type of media. You could even have, uh, in some cases, maybe, uh, maybe you have more than one connection. Maybe you're using Starlink and you have more than one connection to a, a Starlink satellite and, and you're, uh, for redundancy sake. So geogra geography can play into how the topology is going to be uh, architected. All right, uh, in relation to, um, in relation to uh, standards, uh, there's some standards that you do need to know. This is really just for test purposes. You don't really need to like memorize it. Um, 802.5 is token ring outside of test reasons. Uh, first off, if you have to deal with token ring, then maybe you want to figure out some other place to work but bonded ethernet that's that's something that might be interesting to you based on what your job duties are or the the makeup of your network obviously gigabit ethernet's everywhere now uh, and so on but in relation to uh you know just everyday uh, work or discussions or responsibility the fact that you know the 802.3u is fast ethernet is probably irrelevant again outside of test purposes or test reasons all right so we also have data signaling um, which is real simple um, it's either being sent analog or digitally so uh, almost everything's digital nowadays but analog uh, if you have are dealing with a modem or the use of a modem then that's definitely analog so a, a good question that could be asked if again for certification reasons uh, if you had a question like what device is using analog signaling and a modem is one of the answers that's the one I would pick um, having said that you'd probably have to rob a museum to figure out how you could get a modem because I don't think they even make those anymore um, maybe they do maybe they don't I don't know uh, then we also have data uh, data synchronization on whether it's sent asynchronously or synchronously uh, asynchronous is an untimed manner so data is sent when it's sent and it's received when it's which when it's requested um, data could be um, there is no actual timeline on when data has to be sent um, and this is where when you get into old school uh, wording like CSMA CD carrier sense multiple access collision detection that would be an asynchronous communication uh, because it's untimed so the last part collision detection the the computers the devices in the uh you know the network cards and so on they would need to see if the network is free and clear in order to transmit so they avoid 
uh, having collisions, so collision detection. So CSMA, CD, that's, again, old school stuff. However, then you also have synchronous, where data is sent in a timed manner. So token ring, for example, or any network that's token-based will be based on a timed um, schedule. So basically, if a token is sent and it's not received at a certain time, then there's assumed to be a problem. And that token goes around the network. It's very common in ring networks because the token just goes around and around and around. And people put stuff on the token, take stuff off the token, you know, based on either data they're sending or data they're receiving. You also have baseband and broadband. Uh, it's, it's real simple to figure out. Baseband is where the entire cable is used for one channel. So 10 base T or 100 base T, otherwise known as Ethernet. So the entire cable is used to transmit and receive. All right, broadband is different. And broadband used to be, I don't know if it's still around for homes, but you used to be able to get broadband uh, as a form of getting internet. And the idea behind that is you'd have one cable that would uh, send and receive, but it would be for more than one house. So how did they, how did they prevent house A from seeing the internet traffic from house B? Well, they had different channels uh, that, that did that, that allowed it. T1 line still, you can have multiple channels in a T1 line or a T3 line um, if you're in Europe and so on. So let's talk about some equipment. All right, let me just click through this so we can not click so much. Um, hardware found at the physical layer, uh, like I said before, this is fairly unintelligent hardware, you know, T connectors, terminators. So a terminator on the end of a Cat5 cable, that's still a terminator just because it's plastic and doesn't look like what we have uh, on, the, on the slides. It's still a terminator. Uh, remember how I said don't mess around with 10 base 2 or 10 base 5, a.k.a. ThickNet and, and ArcNet and whatever else? Well, Vampire Taps, that's that bottom one, a transceiver. Um, yeah, you don't want to mess with that. It's just old school stuff. You're going you're gonna to hate it. Uh, obviously, cable in general, fiber optic, and then we're back to hubs again. If you remember hubs, uh, your true hub, if it has a MAC address, it's not a hub. It's a switch. Hubs do not have MAC addresses. Uh, active and passive hubs, uh, again, so if we were on port 1 on that hub you see in the graphic, and we had, uh, I don't know, whatever, the 20 other computers plugged in, if we sent a single piece of data into the hub, the hub would send that same piece of data out to all 20 computers uh, at the same time. Um, and this, in some cases, resulted in, you know, broadcast storms or, you know, things like that, which is how switches came into play and why they're so important in today's world is in order to prevent uh, broadcast storms and, and so on. Um, and we'll talk about switches in the, the data link uh, video, the OSI model, the data link portion of the OSI model uh, video uh, coming soon to a theater near you. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments or suggestions or anything you would like for us to talk about, feel free to just let me know and then we'll see what we can do to help you out. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys later. See you.